Hello, welcome to Endor Model Railway. I really enjoy sound fitted trains, but because of the high cost of sound decoders I've been wondering for a while if I'd be able to make my own DCC decoders for a lot less money. It might prove too difficult, but I think I'll enjoy the process of trying and it'll be extremely satisfying if it works. I'm going to approach this in manageable steps, and my first practical step is to get a Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller to detect and understand some basic DCC commands, which is what I'll cover in this video. There's already code that people have made freely available for Arduino and Raspberry Pi for decoding DCC commands, but because I enjoy programming I'm going to write my own code for this from scratch. The very first thing to do is get an understanding of how DCC actually works. Over the years I've heard conflicting things on various YouTube channels and websites, so a while ago I went to the National Model Railroad Association's website and read through some of their standards that define DCC. DCC delivers full power to the tracks all the time. One rail will always be full voltage more than the other rail. My gauge master system delivers 13 volts. I'll assume the high voltage is 13 and the low is zero. DCC constantly flips which rail is at high or low voltage, and how long a particular rail stays high represents a digital one or zero. Each high period is repeated and happens on one rail, then the rail voltages are flipped and it happens for the same duration on the other rail. There's an exception to that called zero stretching, where one of the pairs of high can be a lot longer than the other. The NMRA Electrical Standards for Digital Command Control, S9.1, explains this clearly, along with specific information about durations and acceptable tolerances. I'm not aiming to make something fully NMRA compliant, certainly not to start with, I just want to get something that works. I haven't digested all detail of the electrical standards because I'm not an electrical engineer, but it seems to be implied that decoders will be monitoring the highs and lows on both rails. My first deviation from the standard will be to use the signal from only one of the rails, because it keeps things simpler. Not many electrical components are needed for this. The direction of the electrical current between rails alternates as the DCC signal flips the highs and the lows. By connecting diodes to each rail I can allow current to flow from the high of one rail and back to the low of the other rail, but prevent it flowing when the highs and lows flip. So in theory that results in an intermittent 13 volt signal that I can use. I don't have an oscilloscope to measure the pattern of current flow, so I had to make do with my multimeter. When this is set to AC voltage detection it shows the track power to be at about 13 volts, which in one sense is no surprise, but the DCC signal is a square wave AC signal, unlike mains electricity which has a sine wave. Perhaps in this mode the multimeter is just looking for a peak voltage over a small period. If I measure the track power with the multimeter in DC mode it shows a very small value. The track power is not direct current, so it's the wrong mode to have the multimeter in, but I thought this could be useful because if you were to take the average voltage over a period longer than the highs and lows of the DCC signal, it should come out at about zero. Basically, the alternating high and low between the tracks cancel each other out when averaged. The NMRA standard mentions this. Armed with that knowledge, taking a DC measure of the voltage from just one rail, I expected to get an average over equal periods of 13 volts and 0 volts, which would be 6.5 volts. But it actually measured 8.8 .8 volts. Hmm. That looks suspiciously like two-thirds of full voltage. I think the fact I got near zero when I measured the DC voltage over both rails shows that whatever the DCC signal is doing, zero stretching or whatever, it's balancing out. So the same should apply to measuring just one rail. It should balance out at six and a half. To see if I'd done things right with the diodes, I made some extra connections the other way around to get the signal from the other rail and combined both signals. This is how a diode based bridge rectifier works to turn an AC supply into DC, and indeed it resulted in the expected 13 volts DC. I don't know how the multimeter actually works, so feeling confident I'd set the connections and diodes up correctly I decided to move on. The Raspberry Pi Pico's inputs accept up to 3.3 volts, so I bought a voltage regulator to drop the signal to that. It says it tolerates up to 40 volts in, and if it's receiving at least 3.3 volts, it will output 3.3 volts. 
When connected to one rail signal, it should be getting 13 volts half of the time and should output 3.3 volts half of the time, averaging 1.65. The multimeter recorded 2.2 volts, which is two thirds of the full power and therefore consistent with the 8.8 .8 volts the multimeter shows going into it. Just to be sure it doesn't output something higher than 3.3 volts, which could fry my Pico, I tested it with the combined signals from both rails and it measured 3.3 volts DC. Before progressing to writing code on the Pico, I needed to understand exactly what it should be detecting. The electrical standards for DCC specify the exact timing information to turn track voltage periods into DCC ones and zeros. Earlier, I said the voltage level on one rail gets repeated on the other rail. The standards consider both of those to form one complete DCC bit and refer to half bits or first and last parts of a bit. From a decoder's point of view, a half of a 1 bit, so that's the high on one rail, that's for between 52 and 64 microseconds. The other half, that's the following high on the other rail, has the same minimum and maximum duration, and its duration must also be within 3 microseconds of the duration of the first half. So for example, a first half of 54 microseconds and a second half of 62 microseconds would be invalid. The rules for a DCC 0 bit are slightly different. Each received half has to be between 90 and 10,000 microseconds. There's no constraint on how similar their durations are, and the command station has to keep their combined transmitted duration to a maximum of 12,000 microseconds. The standard doesn't say anything about the total received duration, so I read that as meaning a total of between 180 and 20,000 must be considered acceptable by a decoder for a DCC0, even though a command station shouldn't produce anything much more than half of that. I'll come back later to exactly how I detected the ones and zeros on the Pico. To generate DCC signals on the layout, I first set my controller to have loco number 4 going forwards at speed 0, then increased it to speed step 1 just before starting a program on the Pico to capture the signals, then almost immediately increased the speed on the controller to step 2. This gives specific instructions to expect in the DCC signals recorded by the Pico. To know what to expect means understanding the DCC general packet format, specified in NMRA standard S9.2. A packet starts with at least 12 ones in a row, called a preamble, then a zero. Having looked at other parts of the standards, I think the only time that many ones can appear consecutively is in a preamble, so looking out for these works as a reliable way of detecting the start of a packet. The next eight bits are for the decoder address. In the context of DCC, I don't think addresses below zero would make sense, so I'll interpret these in the normal way for unsigned binary numbers. The standard says the most significant bit is the first one transmitted. I won't go into detail about interpreting binary numbers in this video, and I'll be able to use Python programming utilities to do the conversions for me to analyze. For a locomotive address of four, I'd expect the address bits to be five zeros, then one, then two zeros. Next is a zero bit, which I assume is present to make sure only the preamble can be a long run of ones. The most fundamental commands in DCC are defined in this standard as baseline packets, and include some speed and direction commands. The next 8 bits in a speed and direction command packet are called an instruction data byte and always start with a 0 then a 1. The next bit is for the direction, a value of 1 meaning forwards and 0 meaning backwards. What happens with the remaining bits depends on the value of CV29 in the decoder, but I'm not sure how the controller knows about that. This document says that for backwards compatibility this fourth transmitted bit can be used for controlling the headlight. Since all of my decoders are from within the last few years, I'm going to assume they don't need anything termed as for backwards compatibility in a standard from 20 years ago. So I haven't looked into this in detail, in which case this bit is part of the speed step number. The remaining four bits are also about speed, and the way to use all possible values for five speed bits is helpfully given in a table. It took me a little while to get my head around how to use the bits in code to arrive at the right speed steps but the S9.2 document does give the necessary information. In this video, I just want to focus on the values I should expect to detect from the tracks.
In the order in which they're transmitted, the first two bits of the instruction byte are always 0, then 1. And because my controller commands were for forward speeds, the third bit should always be 1. Using the speeds table, the remaining five bits for speed step 1 should be 00010, and for speed step 2 should be 10010. That's most of the way now to what a full packet should contain. After that instruction byte comes a 0 bit, and then 8 bits for error detection. The error detection is calculated by comparing the bits of the address and the instruction bytes. If one or the other bit, but not both, are 1, then the corresponding bit in the error detection byte is set to 1. The error byte isn't a guarantee that errors in transmission or decoding will be detected, but it makes detecting them much more likely, and I found it very useful. After the error detection byte is a single bit with value 1, which concludes the baseline packet. There are other types of instructions and packet formats, but I haven't read much about them yet because this baseline packet format looked like it should be enough to get a proof of concept up and running. The standard states that a base station should repeat commands as frequently as possible, so for what I did with my controller I'd expect to see the commands for speed step 1 being repeated, followed by repeated commands for speed step 2. Over a few weeks I'd been thinking about how I would record and process the signal on the Pico. The timings in the DCC specifications are in microseconds, and they're not all rounded to tens or anything like that. The measurements that the Pico makes need to be very accurate. A microsecond is one millionth of a second. The processor at the heart of the Pico is the RP2040, which processes instructions at 133 MHz, which is 133 million instructions per second. I don't know how many CPU instructions it takes to measure and store the value of an input in MicroPython code, but it seems like 133 should be plenty, so I thought MicroPython code running on a Raspberry Pi Pico should be fast enough to measure the DCC signal. For now, the code I've written to run on the Pico is just about capturing the timing of high or low voltage levels coming from the track, which it then prints out for me to analyse separately. I'm only measuring the signal from one rail. The Pico is repeatedly checking whether the signal from it is high or low, and when it changes from one to the other, it records the time in microseconds. Once it's recorded 5,000 of those, it prints them and finishes. When analysing the numbers, I don't actually need to know whether the change in voltage was from low to high or high to low. If the real signal looked like this, and my assumption about the voltage levels is the wrong way around, it means I end up measuring the gaps between the high periods, which will be the same as the high periods on the other rail, so still results in valid values. The analysis code is able to seemingly reliably decode the commands for loco4 to go forward at speed 1 and then speed 2. Given the large number of voltage level changes collected, I think this shows my setup with the diodes and voltage regulator is viable. If it was introducing random delays or making a noisy electrical signal, I don't think I'd be able to decode all of those DCC baseline packets without getting errors in some of them. On the other hand, I'm not convinced about using MicroPython for this. It took experimentation with several different approaches before I arrived at code that collected numbers that made sense, and I think it's because the code just isn't running fast enough. Even for this approach that worked, where the code is in a loop constantly checking the input level, the results aren't ideal. The values it actually reported aren't all within a valid range according to the DCC specification. If the analysis interprets them strictly, then it doesn't produce a single good packet or even a valid preamble. In this output here, I've put a dot for each invalid interval, and at the end some summary information about those bad intervals. Quite a few are just slightly too short to be a DCC1, the 50 and 51 microseconds and lots are quite a bit too long to be a valid one. They're generally well over 64 microseconds. In fact, they're approaching the halfway point between a valid one and a valid zero, which is 77 microseconds. It's only when I adjust the analysis code to accept all of these as representing a DCC one that I get the expected packet information. I wrote a slightly modified version of this data collection code that recorded the time in microseconds on each loop through, rather than recording the times of the input value flipping. It's still performing all of the minimum necessary things to collect DCC signal values, so it's recording how long it takes in MicroPython to do that. It shows it usually takes somewhere in the low to mid 30s milliseconds, 
and in one outlier it was well above the maximum DCC1 length at 79, not far off the minimum of 90 for a DCC0. I've had a think about various scenarios, and I think if the sampling period generally stays below 40 microseconds, it should be possible to successfully decode most DCC signal packets, but the code would have to accept anything from low 30s to high 70s as a valid one, and assume there's always a good signal on the tracks. But if a maxed out Pico can only just reliably detect and record the DCC signal, how is it going to have time to do anything useful with it? The RP2040 processor actually has two cores, meaning instructions can be processed in parallel, so I could dedicate one core to monitoring the input level, and then do all of the less time critical stuff on the other core. I haven't looked into any of that yet though. The approach of measuring the input in a wire loop wasn't the first one that I tried, and I think it's worth talking about the other approaches. The RP2040 and other processors have a feature called interrupts. With these, it's possible to register some code to be run when the hardware detects certain things happening, including changes to voltage levels on inputs. The main code will literally be interrupted, it will be almost immediately paused for the registered interrupt code to run, and this sounded ideal for monitoring the DCC signal. However, through various scenarios I wasn't able to get timing data that made much sense. The closest I managed was when I had an interrupt handler that ran only when a single input's voltage went from low to high, but it had errors. After a reasonable amount of analysis I noticed the location of the errors within the packet was very consistent, and eventually I realised I must have been recording the rail that was getting the second part of each bit. When measuring only the start of high periods the code needs to be receiving the first half of the bits, because it's measuring the period up until the start of the next bit. I think I was recording mixtures of ones and zeros. This means measuring just the start of highs or just the start of lows on one rail isn't a viable approach. The decoder has no way of knowing whether it's getting the first or last part of the bits. I tried a few variations on this, like triggering the interrupt when the voltage went either high or low, or connecting a second pin to the other rail and measuring the rise to high voltage on each pin, but nothing seemed to produce numbers that made sense. Having tried the while loop approach, my conclusion is that it's a faster approach than use of interrupts, at least in MicroPython. Something else I considered is the possibility of the DCC voltages being a bit noisy, and triggering spurious interrupts, but I didn't do any kind of debouncing for the rise to high interrupts on a single rail, and over thousands of interrupts it collected what looked to be consistent and correct DCC bits, so I think it's likely there's a good signal coming in. I think for a first step this is still a success, and I've learned useful detail about the DCC baseline packet. I've also found it fun working out what's going on and trying to find solutions. Next possible steps are either to try the multi-core approach on the Pico using MicroPython, or start looking into how to program the Pico using C or C++. C and C++ are both faster than Python, I've got no doubt the performance will be better, but I don't know how big the difference will be. A quick Google shows plenty of articles and videos on programming the Pico using them, and I think that's what I'll most likely do next with this project. That's all for now. Bye bye!